Welcome back to Historical Context. Today we continue our series on the colonies during the English Commonwealth. Today's episode takes us to Rhode Island where we talk about the split that occurs in Rhode Island and how the colonists handled that. Rhode Island's history is preserved a little differently than the other colonies I've covered. While some primary sources exist, it appears that historical writings of the 18th and 19th centuries best represent the, the early story of the colony. John Callender wrote a historical discourse in 1738 that was designed to celebrate the colony's centennial, so it covered the first hundred years of Rhode Island. And those types of books seem to be a little more helpful. A general history of Rhode Island appears to have a better account of the legislative assemblies than some of the other resources for other colonies that I've looked at. We last left off in Rhode Island in 1648, where the colony united and elected its first president. That's what they called the head of the colony, John Coggeshaw. Coggeshaw would actually die before his term ended, although some accounts stated he didn't want the job and then and quit. Any way you put it, Coggeshaw did not finish a one-year term. Jeremy Clark would serve one year as president of the colony before handing the reins off to John Smith in 1649. While the colony was getting off the ground in its early days, a man by the name of William Coddington was aspiring to separate cities in the two colonies and went so far as to leave Rhode Island for England in late 1649 to assert his rights there. He wanted an independent colony from the four towns that comprised of Rhode Island. Coddington was like many other Rhode Islanders. He came to the New World via the Massachusetts Bay Colony, and in fact, he was in the same fleet as John Winthrop. He got caught up in the antinomian controversy with John Wheelwright and Anne Hutchinson and ended up being banished from the colony. But shortly after establishing Portsmouth, there was a split from the Roger Williams faction and Coddington and his allies left to establish Newport. When Roger Williams returned with a patent for all four Rhode Island towns, that would be Providence, Warwick, Portsmouth, and Newport, Coddington was not very happy, so that's what led him to go out to England and assert his rights there. When Coddington arrived in England in 1649, he found the country in transition. He met up with Sir Henry Vane. We may remember him. He's a former Massachusetts Bay governor who had helped Roger Williams with his patent years earlier. So now Coddington's over. Uh, trying to get Henry Vane's help. While in England, Plymouth Governor Josiah Winslow was there pressing the rights of his colony, Plymouth. Coddington presented his petition for an independent colony that would separate Providence and Warwick with Portsmouth and Newport. And he was granted his own charter, known as the Coddington Commission, in April of 1651. While he was gone, Nicholas Easton served a one-year term as the colony's president. The assembly that year focused on bolstering the town's defenses by requiring a minimum amount of powder, lead, pikes, and muskets to be on hand. Also, it is noted in 1650 that some towns had not paid Roger Williams for his service. 
which was discussed on a previous episode. That was Williams going to England to get the original patent. This would further lead to the indication that there's probably some division going on in Rhode Island. Warwick was a colony that was aligned with Providence, while Newport was aligned with Portsmouth. So when Coddington returned, the colony officially split, thanks to his commission, into two separate colonies with a man by the name of Samuel Gorton as president of the two towns of Providence and Warwick, and Coddington assigned governor for life of the towns of Portsmouth and Newport. So Samuel Gorton is governor on his side and Coddington governor for life on his side. Coddington's ambitions and his cards may be showing in the fact that he's named himself governor for life. Samuel Gorton had his own story to tell. Like Williams and Coddington, Gorton had been banished to Portsmouth, but from Plymouth, not Massachusetts Bay. Gorton did serve time in prison in Charlestown because of his beliefs. Like Coddington and Williams, Gorton sailed to England to get official protection and permission to settle in Rhode Island. He was granted such protection by the Earl of Warwick. Gorton was so grateful for the protection that he renamed Shawomet to Warwick. The first resolution passed by the Assembly of Providence and Warwick shines some light on what may have happened. Let's have a look. Whereas it is evident and apparent that Mr. Nicholas Easton, being formally chosen president of the province of Providence Plantations, hath of late deserted his office, and he, together with the two towns upon Rhode Island, Portsmouth and Newport, have declined and fallen off from that established order of civil government and incorporation among us, by means of a commission presented upon the said island by William Connington. We, the rest of the towns of the said jurisdiction, are thereupon constrained to declare ourselves that we do profess ourselves to unanimously stand embodied and incorporate as before by virtue of our charter granted unto us by the honorable state of old England and thereby do according to our legal and settled order choose and appoint our officers institute laws according to the constitution of the place and capacity of our present condition prosecuting acting and executing all matters and causes for the doing of justice reservation of our peace and maintaining of all civil rights between man and man according to the honorable authority and true intent of our aforesaid charter granted unto us that's a lot there, but essentially they're saying we, Providence and Warwick, are going to stand alone independently and honor the charter that was granted to Roger Williams. So they would send Williams back to England. And the reason they did this is because they felt the Coddington Commission may inadvertently have voided their charter. And this would expose them to William Coddington and his allies. He could just uh, take over. So now they want their two towns to be legitimized in a new charter by the English government. In September, the Plymouth Colony is advised to take Providence and Warwick by force. And they're advised by the United Colonies. That's a scary moment. Now, fortunately, Plymouth is in a state of decline at this time, and it's not going to be standing alone for long. That probably held them back from doing anything, and I'm assuming the United Colonies was not going to raise their own army to help them. Meanwhile, 41 citizens in Portsmouth and 65 of Newport came together and appointed Dr. John Clark to go to England and ask that the Coddington Commission be repealed. That's right. 
106 of Coddington's own citizens were not having it. They did not support him. Dr. Clark was a physician and a minister. He founded a Baptist church in Newport shortly after Williams founded a Baptist church in Providence. These are the first two Baptist churches in America. Clark and Roger Williams would travel through Massachusetts in order to sail outbound to England. While in Massachusetts, Clark and two others are arrested and jailed for an illegal church service. I'm not sure what Williams was doing at the time, but keep in mind, I don't think they were necessarily, even though they both went through Massachusetts, they didn't go together. And so Clark is in Massachusetts holding his own church service to his own beliefs and gets arrested. Someone paid the fine for Dr. Clark, so he got freed. But Obadiah Holmes, one of the three men, was whipped publicly for his crime, demonstrating the opposition Puritans showed towards the Baptists. Clark and Williams were going through Massachusetts Bay because they had to get on a boat there to get to England. And Clark and Williams would end up sailing on the same ship to head to England. And that's interesting. I don't see anything about what they actually would have discussed on that trip, which is unfortunate. I would love to know that. Whatever was said, when they get to England, Clark and Williams would present a joint petition to the government in April of 1652. This petition would be forwarded to the Council of State, and that is essentially the executive branch existing in England. Roger Williams wrote later in the year that he felt encouraged by the events in England, and he felt confident that they would get their patent. While Williams and Clark were still in England, the general court met at Warwick to continue the business of the two towns, Warwick and Providence. John Smith is elected president of the colony for the second time, and on May 18, 1652, a significant piece of legislation is passed. Let's have a look. Let it be ordered that no black mankind or white be forced to covenant bond or otherwise to serve any man or his assigns longer than 10 years or until they come to be 24 years of age if they be taken in under 14. From the time of their coming within the liberties of this colony and at the end or term of 10 years to set them free, as the manner is with the English servants. And that man that will not let them go free or shall sell him away elsewhere to that end that they may be enslaved to others for a longer time. He or they shall forfeit to the colony 40 pounds. Rhode Island basically makes slavery illegal, and that's what a lot of people talk about when they look at this legislation. But more specifically, they really uh, put boundaries in for indentured servitude. We saw this problem come up in Virginia up to this point. We'd seen instances where Europeans and African indentured servants would escape. They'd be caught. The Europeans would get extended sentences. And then there were Africans like John Punch who were sentenced to a lifetime of indentured servitude. Historians have written that subsequently Rhode Island did not enforce this law. But we're going to have to see as time goes on in our, in our writings what that actually looks like. Clearly, they're wanting people to uh, abide by specific guidelines for indentured servitude to set people free. How does that look 100 years from then? We'll have to find out. In late 1652, the Council of State decided to revoke Coddington's charter and restore the charter of Roger Williams for the whole Rhode Island colony. 
A notice arrived to the towns in Rhode Island in February 1653, and it was actually read aloud on March 1st, 1653. The towns still elected separate governments that year before finally uniting again in 1654. But if you think that hard feelings of division did not exist, check out this excerpt from John Callender's Historical Discourse, which was written in 1738, 85 years later. Let's have a look. But the people being jealous, the commission might affect their lands and liberties as secured to them by the patent. He readily laid it down on the first notice from England that he might do so, and for their further satisfaction and contentment, he, by a writing under his hand, obliged himself to make a formal surrender of all right and title to any of the lands, more than his proportion in common with the other inhabitants, whenever it should be demanded. Calendar would go on to call William Coddington a good man full of days. And he dedicated his book, The Discourse, to William Coddington. We'll look at more of Calendar's writings in future episodes, but uh, next week we're going to do a special short episode on the early days of the English Commonwealth because we talk back and forth a little bit and touch on it a bit, but I want to talk about what actually is going on in England. I think it's good reference information for future history of the colonies. So we're going to break away from the colonies, a brief episode on what's going on in England, and then in two weeks, we go back to Virginia. Remember, several weeks ago, they surrendered after uh, a lengthy standoff with English Commonwealth forces. Are they going to come under compliance or are there going to be bigger problems? We're going to find out next time on Historical Context. <music>